Hey there, beloved saints. I wanted to do something to encourage you guys. Sorry, the wheelchair is like rolling, <laughs> rolling way back here in the chair. Um, I wanted to do something to really encourage you. Uh, it's so interesting when I hear uh, people that, w what I believe, just based on their own testimony, are saved, uh, discuss the Bible or make comments about God's character or things that are in the scripture. But I found that when you look at scripture as a whole and you see Christ in all of it, it all, it all makes sense. Like it, it, it's not just the surface understanding. And I, I think that's what the Lord meant about, you know, having eyes, but they can't see. Uh, and that, you know, when the scales fell off of Paul's eyes, literally, they also spiritually fell off. He could see Christ in everything. In the scriptures and he also tells us I think it's in the first Corinthian book that all these things happen to the forefathers the patriarchs as an example for us and they were written for our admonition so uh, when you see Jesus in it when it's all types and shadows of him and what he would do it only confirms who Jesus is and how it's all God's plan it's it's a wonderful um but i want to go over abraham so what they're discussing was abraham and you know i've heard everything from god wanted child sacrifice to uh just wanted to test him see how much he loved his son or he shouldn't love uh, his son more than god and, and that was not the point of it at all not the point at all i i believe hebrews tells us what the point of that was. Um, now, we still see this today, and I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. I'm hoping you'll be able to see how so many think the works they're doing makes them like Abraham, but it's really taking God at his word, hearing God's promise, believing that what God said he'd give you or that he's done He's able to do and trusting him. That's what Abraham did. And the reason this is so significant is because Abraham knew God's character. Now, let me tell you what, I, what I'm getting at here. L let's go over to Genesis chapter 22. See, we believe God's report of his son, that he gives us eternal life and that life is in his son that uh, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures is all of this, all of this pointing to him, uh, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And when Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believe thou this, we do. We believe that when we trust him, uh, that it's only through his sacrifice that we have eternal life. And we know we have it because that's what our salvation's based on. And I can't tell you, every day people are like, no, I'm worried I'm not saved and they got me confused. Okay, if that's the case, you're starting to look at you. Why are you looking at you for your salvation? Of course, I can save you time. You're not good enough. So stop. Just see, you don't ever have to think about it again. You're Because you're not. You'll never be good enough. So stop looking at you to see if you measure up because you're not, not going to. Never have, never could, never will. Okay, so uh, we have the same faith of Abraham because we believe God's promise to us. We take him at his word and know it's true. And that's what the gospel is about. That's about being born again, hearing that God promised eternal life. It's only available through Christ and what he's done. And saying, well, I, I can't do it. I'm completely bankrupt. I can't do anything to save myself. Now, I, this is ridiculous that people bring in the Christian walk to salvation. Salvation is God rescuing us. We do not qualify to be rescued. Okay? There's, you're, you can never do anything good enough to deserve him rescuing you. Okay? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He paid that debt that we owed, which was death, 
And that's why we never die. It's, it, it's because he rescued us. He paid it. So either he did or he did not. Okay. Most people just don't believe it, but Abraham did. Okay. And so I want to show you that the reason he was able to offer Isaac, it's amazing when you see this and it's a simple concept. You probably already know it as saved people, but I like to remind you and apply this to the gospel because just like Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, we believe God and he counts it to us as righteousness. That is the doctrine of imputed righteousness. He puts God's righteous, his own perfect righteousness on all who believe the message and we believe. So mock it, uh, make fun of it, uh, reject it, whatever, but it's how you're saved. So I don't know how you could be saved by something that you reject and mock. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Um, also, let me ask you guys, we have a sister, not the sister Lisa for the Most High Jesus. We want to pray for her too, always, because uh, she contends uh, for the faith. And as far as I know, she may have spoken a little too much truth. And I think they're shutting her channel down because of it. So pray for her. But another sister, Lisa, is in the hospital. Not Lisa Boyce, you, you, not them. Uh, another sister, Lisa, God knows who she is, is in the hospital with COVID. She just got released. She had double pneumonia in her lungs. She's so sad, so lonely. Uh, her mother is in a nursing home and she's all alone. And she's suffered terribly. Please pray for her. And please pray for uh, uh, Brother Roy, you know, Luke's friend, the pastor, the, the preacher. Uh, and pray for Luke and his family uh, and all of us that preach the gospel. All of us, Barry Scarborough, Tim, uh, uh, Ultimate Mordecai. Pray, pray for all of them. Pray for everyone that preaches the true gospel. Because, you know, all of us on the hit list. And pray for one another. Not just preachers, but Christians. Every believer, you know, one's a hand, one's an eye. We're, we're all different parts of the same body. Not one is more important than the other. So we need to pray for all of us. But I only ask for the preachers because, you know, without a preacher, how can they hear and how can they believe on someone that they haven't heard? Uh, so uh, we will start at Genesis chapter 22. And it says, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. And he said, now take thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Wow. Thine only son. I'm sorry. Wasn't Ishmael his son? Okay. Do you know why is it? Because he's the only son of promise. The only son of promise promise. He's also the predominant one in his heart. See, God is using that as a picture of his only begotten son, Jesus. God has many sons and daughters. He has many sons for, you know, whosoever believes on him is, is made a child of God, is, is called, called the sons of God. But he has only one begotten, and that is the pre-existing eternal Jesus, uh, who manifested in the flesh, God manifested in the flesh. Uh, so it's interesting that he used this word, take, pick, take your son, your only son. That's not his only son. Ishmael's his son, legitimately. But see, Ishmael was a child of Abraham's effort and work. Okay. And it tells us here in the scriptures that Sarah and Hagar represent the two covenants and Hagar the bond servant or the slave represents the law and the bondage of the law and therefore Ishmael is not an inheritor of the promise Isaac is the picture of the promise and the inheritance okay because he's the child of promise the one that God gave Abraham and Sarah way past their prime. They should not have physically been able to have children. And God made sure they were both way too old so that nobody could say, oh, it's just a late birth. They knew it was God that brought that child into the world. So Isaac is the only son of promise. And this is important for us because we're applying this to the gospel and the hope we have in Christ. It is such a joyful message. It, it 
just breaks my heart that so many claiming Christ come against it. Sad. Uh, take thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Now you see how this is a picture of God's love for Jesus? It's all here. I'll, I'll, I'll point a few things out. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt... And that's where the Temple Mount is. Mount Moriah. Okay? That's also the same mountain range, I believe, that Calvary is on. The skull, the place of the skull, Golgotha. It's on Mount Moriah. It's this whole area. So he's going to a picture of the crucifixion thousands of years before Jesus came, okay? And Isaac is a type of Christ, in the, just like Joseph was, Zaponephania, savior of the people, right? So every, every one of these is a picture of Jesus. Every, even Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Everywhere you look, it's Jesus. It's all about him. The rock that Moses struck, it's Jesus. That rock was Christ. It's everything. All right, so... So he says, take thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And he's, you love, it sounds like he's rubbing it in, right? No, no. That's not the point of that. It's all a proclamation of God's love for Jesus here. All right. It's also showing us that it's by the promise. And what Abraham does here is amazing. Very simple concept. Probably already know, but I've got to point this out. Okay, because I need people to see that what really pleases God is faith. To take him at his word. You can try to be the best Christian and live the best. All of that's great. And it's great in its proper place. But when it comes to salvation, get it out of here. Because you're turning something beautiful into a mess. Okay, that is a beautiful thing to see a Christian growing and walking in the Lord. But we are talking about salvation and it is based completely on the merit of Christ and not us. So get it out of there, all right? This, this needs to show you that to please God, believe Him. Now, if you're constantly looking at you, well, uh, now I don't feel saved because somebody told me if I don't do that. Okay, who are you believing? Are you believing God's Word? What He said Jesus did for you? Are you believing man, His religion, and His condemnation, and His confusion? The Gospel means... Good news. Now, they insist it's got to be bad news all the time. They're, they're misunderstanding the whole itching ears thing and all of that. That's about saved people hearing uh, 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 that it's okay in their life to do things that, that, that aren't pleasing. It has nothing to do with salvation but uh, strange things. Uh, and that's a whole separate issue. But that has not that is not the gospel. The gospel is good news for a far it's like drinking cold water when you're dying of thirst. Is that supposed to be bad? No. Okay, I digress. All right. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. Now, if you remember, Jesus rode uh, uh, an ass and a coal of an ass into Jerusalem. On the donkey that was a prophecy that was being fulfilled in Zechariah so he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and went up into the place of which God had told him so it's a section on Mount Moriah many believe that is the Temple Mount uh, I believe it could be where Calvary was it doesn't say it wasn't on the Mount where Golgotha or Calvary was because Moriah is that whole mountain range there, Mount Moriah. So, <clears throat> I, I, I think it is. It, it's a picture of Jesus, and you can see it's so clear here. But uh, that's not even the big point I want to make. Let me get to it. All right, so, uh, and he clave the wood for the burnt offering. I need you to listen to these words. And rose up and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day... Third day, when did Jesus rise up? On the third day. Jesus said, I'll give you the, nothing but the sign of Jonah. As, as Jonah was in the, uh, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Okay? Build it, tear down this temple, and in three days, 
I will raise it up again. Remember, third day, all pictures of Jesus. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So he's like, you guys hang out here with the donkey and all our stuff. Me and my son are going to go up there and worship God, and you just wait here for us. Okay, that, that's what he's saying. And I, Abraham, this is important, please hear this, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. So Abraham, the father, took the wood and put it on his son's back. Now go to John 19. John 19, 17. Carrying his own cross. What are crosses made out of? That's right, wood. Curses everyone who hangeth on a tree. Wood. The father, Abraham puts the wood on his son's back as a burden to carry up the hill for the sacrifice. What did Jesus do? They put the wood, the father put the wood on his back and he went up the hill of Calvary carrying that just like Isaac did. Can you see Jesus here? Please tell me you see it. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. See, uh, I like the point Lisa makes. If God wants you to call somebody by a Hebrew name or Aramaic name, he'll tell you. You don't have to go, we've been calling him Jesus and that's wrong. We need to call him Yeshua or Yehoshua or Yeho whichever way they pronounce it. There's many ways they pronounce it. But uh, I know that it was written in corny Greek and it's the name Jesus. And it's like uh, Lisa was pointing out, there was no J, it was an I. So it was Iesus, which turned into Jesus. And it's been the name above all names. So you better get the name right. So uh, I, I just want you to, I wanted to point that out. I went off on a tangent there, but I just want to say, I, I'm not condemning anybody that uses another language to say the name of Jesus. If you got the right Jesus, I'm not here condemning you. I'm just saying, let's not argue about uh, this and that, and you need to be this and get back to your Hebrew root. People for 2,000 years have been saying the name Jesus Christ and praising the Lord. So uh, we don't need to do any of that. We don't need to become Hebrew in order to be saved. All right. So uh, you can see there, Isaac carries the wood on his back. Jesus carrying the wood on his back. You can, oh, you can see it so clear here. And uh, there's much more. I, I wish I had time to break it all down. But then it says, Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, laid it upon his son Isaac, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And by the way, I think uh, the way that's worded is perfect. Because in the new versions, it says, God will provide for himself a lamb. It doesn't say that. It says God will provide himself a lamb. So I think God provided himself as the lamb. Um, I like the way it's worded there. God provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. And laid him on the altar upon the wood. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people condemn Abraham. I've heard a lot of people say, how does he know? It might have been the devil. And there's all this conspiracy that this really isn't the true God. The true God's in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, this was the devil. And he tricked Abraham. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And you'll see why this had to be done. It was for us, okay? It was for us and to glorify Jesus in this story. And you'll see that Abraham knew that his son was not going to be dead, okay? He knew. All right. This is how much faith he had in God. He, he believed God so much. He believed God's promise. What did God promise? 
that through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through Isaac, the one he called his only son, that the Savior would be born and he would be the father of many nations. Remember? Who does that come through? Isaac. Does Isaac have any children yet? No. He's a young lad. He does not have children yet. So Abraham knew that God does not lie and that what he promised, he is able to perform. So when, when God tells him to sacrifice his own son, he's trusting God so much he was going to do it because he knew that God would just raise him up again because the promise had to be fulfilled. And if he didn't do it, then God was a liar. But he knew God was no liar. That's why he did it. He knew. He knew that the promise had yet to be fulfilled. He knew that the Savior would be coming through the line of Isaac and that it had to be done because God said it. It's going to happen. And so if he has to sacrifice his son, God's not going to allow the child to stay dead. He can't because he has to be a father to many nations. And he can't do that if he's dead. So that's how much he trusted God. That's how much he took God at his word. Can you not believe God that he said he saved you through the work of his son? You, can you not just take him at his word? Because that's what he says. That's what pleases God, that you take him at his word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you got to look to your behavior to determine whether you were saved or not, is that seen or not seen? That's seen. That's what you're seeing. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it means we're believing something that we don't see, like Jesus being crucified, or that we have eternal life, or that he gave us the Holy Spirit. We were sealed until the day of redemption. Why? Because God said so. He's not a liar. And I'm, I'm sick of these pseudo-Christians calling God a liar and complicating the gospel and mocking the gospel. It's ridiculous. And then condemning and accusing. Who are these people? Who are you? Okay. So it says, uh, let me see. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So when they did a sacrifice, it was quick. So that angel had to catch him like that. And by the way, I believe that angel was probably a pre-incarnate, maybe a pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know because I do know that when Abraham sat down and ate with God, he came and hung out with him with two angels, that that was a pre-incarnate Christ because uh, that's a Christophany. That was God in the flesh. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when he physically, when God physically shows up in the form of a man in the Old Testament, sometimes he's called the capital A angel of the Lord or messenger of the Lord. Or it says, my name is in him. That's Jesus. Okay. Before he came, before he was born. Remember in the scriptures that says, a body thou hast prepared me. See, God prepared a body for Jesus to, he, he lived, existed with the Father before the world was. It says that. Now glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. So you can see that there. And so this angel, angel the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And again, it wasn't his only son, but he was the only son of promise. The only son that God gave him. Okay, so this is the one that all the promises that the Savior is going to be 
born through the seed of Abraham, Christ himself. Okay? So, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and beheld him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorn. You know what a thicket is, right? It's like a little bush with no leaves. It's just got thorns. He was caught by what? His head? What did Jesus wear on his head? Uh, that's right. A crown of thorns, probably torn right off of a thicket bush and wrapped on his head. Jesus right there. The ram is Jesus. Isaac is Jesus. Can you not see him everywhere? The whole thing is about him. And Abraham believed God. Why can't we? We're supposed to. Abraham lifted his eyes. And what? The ram caught by the in the thicket with the crown of thorns became the substitutionary sacrifice that day. And what is Jesus? Substitutionary sacrifice for us and our sin. Abraham went and took the ram, offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Same thing. Jesus died in the stead of us. In our place became a curse for us. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, which is mean God my provider. That's what it translates to. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn. See, that is possibly why I believe it's this angel of the Lord. Although he's delivering a message from God, um, a lot of times you'll see it gets confusing if you don't understand that God is three yet one because he'll... It'll, he'll say like he's delivering a message from God, but then speak in the first person as if he is God. Uh, so it says, uh, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn. So who swore? God did. Okay. Uh, Sayeth the Lord, Because thou hast done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, again, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and in the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and thy seed, <laughs> all right, all right, I, need you to, I need you to listen to this in a double way, okay? I'm, I'm going too fast. I got to back it up here. All right. In blessing, I will bless thee. This is what God says to Abraham, okay? And you need to know this because these are to you. These blessings, these promises, these are to you if you're in Christ. Because who is the seed of Abraham? Not as seeds, as in an S, as in seeds, as in many, but thy seed, which is Christ. And so those which are the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And if you're in Christ, you are the seed of Abraham and are children of Abraham by faith because you are in the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus. Okay, so the blessing and all of these promises, they are in Christ. That's how God keeps all of his promises because they're fulfilled in Christ. And they're all, every promise given to the seed of Abraham is to Jesus. And all those, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter, in Christ, have those promises. And there's all kinds of uh, messages in here, foreshadows and prophecies, that there's a, I'll, I shall have a people that are not a people, meaning Gentiles from all over, that aren't like a nation. But they will be, and that's what we are, the body of Christ, a holy nation, a priesthood. It says that, even Peter says that. The same words were used to describe the nation of Israel in the Old Covenant. But then, and by the way, we didn't replace Israel. We joined them. Okay? So the believing, see God's people, they're believers. So believing Israelites and then believing Gentiles were grafted into believing Israelites. And the unbelieving ones were cut off. God has not forsaken his people that they should fall. It says that. We're to provoke them to jealousy. So my point is not doom, gloom, and condemn people. My point is to show you we didn't replace them. We joined them. Joined the believing Jews, believing Gentiles, one new man in Christ, the Israel of God. 
the seed of Abraham, which is Christ, the children of Abraham by faith. That is all of us. Okay, it's not to some person with the genealogy, bloodline. All right, so let's go. This is the blessings, okay? And it's important because we have them. If you believe God, you believe God, I want to believe God. In blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. And and how is that? Is that just physical seed? No. But that's true too. Seed of Abraham is Christ, children of Abraham by faith. He's the father of the faithful. So it's an innumerable amount. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Who's that? Who's thy seed, Abraham? Paul tells you, thy seed, which is Christ. So Jesus is the seed of Abraham. There's only one, all right? So uh, how many times does Jesus and John the Baptist have to say, think not unto yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't rely on that. That ain't going to do it. Abraham's only your father if you believe in Jesus. Okay? It says that. Okay. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Did that not get fulfilled? Yes, it did. Jesus took the keys to hell, death, and the grave. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. Now do you see Jesus there? Who's the seed? Again, it's Jesus. And in thy seed, which is Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Can you see it now? No, the nations of the earth are not blessed by a lot of Jewish people. The nations of the earth are blessed in Jesus because he brings salvation to the world. Okay? So, I mean, it says God gave, he loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. So, uh, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And how's that? Because uh, it, salvation was offered to the Gentiles. That's every nation salvation has been offered. That's why we're all blessed because of Jesus. In thy seed, Abraham. He's talking about Jesus there. Uh, so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Okay, so let me see. So, we can see there the picture of the crucifixion. Of, we pointed out a few of the little types and shadows. We can go on and on with that, okay? Uh, but right here, I wanted you to see that the whole time, these promises, that the, the na all the nations would be blessed, it had to happen through Isaac. And I think that God continuing to say, Take your son, your only son, the son you love. He kept saying that just to remind him, the one with all the promises in him. Because he knew that even if God allowed him to sacrifice his own son, that God would raise him up from the dead to keep his promise. And we can't even believe God for something he's already done? He's already saved us through what Jesus did. You, you don't complicate it because you don't like it. You don't complicate it because, uh, well, that wouldn't be fair. You could just do this. It, leave that to God. Let God deal with his own kids. If they're disobedient let and they're born into his family by faith, and they get this, let them worry about it. Let church discipline. Why are you all up worrying about change in the gospel because somebody might think they could do whatever they want that's just silly we have a we're born of god the spirit is in us and if we spend time in the word you'll see growth but none of that has anything to do with us and and being uh good enough or uh what do they call it back in the puritan time? sensible sinners he only saves sensible sin it's so funny how they every generation has tried to corrupt the gospel and make some qualifier for it. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you just won't qualify. You'll never do it. 
You'll never, you, I can save you all that time of wondering. Nope. Nope. You sure don't. You sure are not good enough. You will never be good enough. So he knew that God would raise up his son from the dead. And he was, okay, I'll sacrifice my son because I know that God has to bring him back because someone has to be born through my son and he can't be born if my son is dead. So he believed God. He believed God so much that he believed he could raise his son up from the dead. He knew that God had raised his dead, uh, unproducing body, didn't he? He gave him a child in his old age, over 100 years old. So let's go to Hebrews. There's one little verse there that tells us exactly that. Let's go over to Hebrews 11. A lot of people misunderstand the book of Hebrews. I think it's one of the best eternal security books there are. Um, a lot of this is about things that accompany salvation. You guys should be teachers by now, but you keep going back to this Levitical law and the temple system stuff. Yeah, all that was a shadow of Jesus. None of that can take away sins. Cut that out. Come over here and stand in the truth with a heart and full assurance of faith. And don't doubt God because you'll be like those people that had all these terrible consequences in the Old Testament and all these examples. Okay, and that's what's going on in this book. Uh, it, it has nothing to do uh, with being threatened to lose salvation. It's just some of the crazy things people or sinning away the blood of Jesus. If you willfully sin, there will remain no worse sacrifice. And uh, I've done so many videos on that. That is uh, the willful sin of not believing God and rejecting Jesus' once for all sacrifice and returning to the Levitical law, thinking that that's going to save you. So there is no more sacrifice for sin because Jesus died once for all. God doesn't accept any other sacrifice. So that's why there's no more sacrifice for sin. Not because you sinned on purpose and therefore have, have sinned away the blood of Jesus. As if your personal sin is so great, it's more powerful than God manifested in the flesh dying for you. That's how powerful you are. So you're more powerful than the blood of Christ. Your sin is, come on, Adam is more powerful than the second Adam. Do you see what an insult that is to Jesus? You can sin away the blood of Jesus. He, he bore the sin of the whole world. He was so precious that his blood was priceless. It paid, it was an overpayment. How can you say one person can out sin or sin away the blood? It's just ignorance of the scriptures. So, I mean, there's people with books that translate that verse like that. I mean, it's so obvious what the context is. It's just horrible. But again, you can't see it. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start here at 1, and I'm going to skip down to the verse I want to show you about Abraham. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And for us, it's not, oh, I hope so, I might make it. No, it's a sure hope. It's something that we know we're going to have and are looking forward to getting it. That is a biblical hope, something that God says we have. And so we're looking forward to it with great anticipation. That's hope in scriptures, not, oh, I'm just going to stay positive and hope I make it into heaven. No, it's not that. It's not like, oh, I might make it. It's you, you're going to have it. It's yours. And the hope is that one day I do have it. And that's a hope. It brings a hope in you. It gives you like a joy and a uh, expectation of receiving. Okay? That's hope in scripture here for the evidence of things not seen. So, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Do you remember that? When the two the spies, everybody else came out with a bad report and they're like, no, we can handle it. Our God's bigger than these giants. He can handle it. But everyone's like, no, we're like grasshoppers in this. Again, they didn't believe God. He said, I can take you into the promised land. You're going to, I'm going to give you this land. They're like, no, no, these giants are too big. Oh, we'll never defeat them. Okay. So they didn't believe God. What did he wander around in a circle for 40 years? And that's what you're going to do. You're going to do the same thing. If you say, oh, my sin's too big. The blood of Christ can't, that can't save me. I better start. Okay, you're going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years or however long you live. Because that's what's going to happen. Until you relax and believe God, 
take him at his word, admit defeat, because that's real humility there, to go, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that law, that broke me. I, I can't, I can't live, Jesus up the standard so high, he said, if I even look at a woman with lust, uh, uh, you know, uh, I got to cut out eyes and hands, and I'm going to, I, uh, I take my own heart out, I reckon, because I, I just can't do it. Yeah, that's where you need to be. Well, then who can be saved? Yeah, exactly. Who can be saved? With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. So, uh, it sounds humble to say you got to do this, and you need to do this, and fear God, and live the certain way, and all that's great, because we should, once we're saved. But see, they're making it about salvation, and that's why it's a messed up deal. Uh, but it's actually pride. It's backwards pride. It's saying, I can contribute to my own salvation. Salvation's about me and what I'm doing, not what Jesus did. Golly, what an insult. What an insult. All right, so it says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. And the Word of Faith people twist that. It's not saying that by faith the worlds were made. Like God had faith and he spoke it into existence. That's what they're trying to say it means. No, by faith, we understand. Okay, so what we're do what what is by faith is the understanding that God made the world by speaking it, even though we didn't see Him do it. By faith we believe that. Okay, that's all that verse is saying. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. I'm sorry, what was that? Blood, the blood of the lamb. What did Cain bring? Works of the field. What he did, stuff he did. Okay, and what happened? He hated his brother. And the same thing today, Paul tells us, those that are in bondage, that are the, uh, of the works of the law, hate and persecute those that are of the promise. Legalists will always hate gospel believers. They will mock us. They will lie about us. They will accuse us. Nothing's changed. Same thing was going on. Even Paul said, as we slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil so good may come, whose damnation is just. So they were slanderously saying, we say, uh, let us do evil so good may come, or you can just sin all you want because we're under grace. None of us have ever said any of that mess. All right. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, why did he please God? He believed it. When you believe, because it, it tells you why they all, what do all these people have in common? Yeah, they did some good works and stuff, but they did some bad ones. Like Noah, he did some great stuff, but passed out drunk, naked. You know, I mean, we all do crazy stuff like that. Uh, so it's not about their works. They're not perfect and upright because of them. They're perfect and upright because they believed God. All right? Same thing. Apply this to the gospel because that's what this is about. All of this. It's all to prepare you to confirm who Jesus is and what he did on Calvary. What did that accomplish? I don't know. Ask many professing Christians and it'll just say, well, he's a supplement for your righteousness pretty much is what they'll tell you. You really got to do this, 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 and this, and this, 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 and you might make it because uh, Jesus died on the cross. It's still about what you're doing, though. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's already promised. I mean, how much more does God have to do? He sends his own son, fulfills the law, lives a sinless life, offers salvation, eternal life, no more death, no more sin in the flesh and struggling against it, all of that, a whole new creature to live forever and serving the Lord and praising the Lord and with our loved ones again as a free gift and we just can't, we just can't believe that. All he, that's all he asked. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And, and it tells you right here, you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But he's already done it. It's already done. 
Salvation is not a reward, by the way. But if you just take God at his word, it's the greatest thing you can do for God. Believe him. Don't question him. Oh, I don't know if God's going to do that. What? He's already done it. I'm trying to get you guys to see another way because a lot of people think that it's so very righteous and right sounding what these preachers say. And it's great if they move it out of this and put it back over here where it belongs with discipleship and Christian growth and walk, not with salvation. All right. That's all we're doing. We're taking out all the stuff about us and how we should live and what we're doing and getting it away from salvation and putting it over here where it belongs in our Christian walk and spiritual maturity, service to God, discipleship, not salvation, cannot be mixed up because that's another gospel. All right. So by faith, and it goes on, it tells you all these things by faith, by faith, by faith. Noah did this because he believed God. Abraham did this because he believed God. It's the same thing. You know, whatever we do, we do it because we already know we have eternal life. Not to get it, but because I know I got it. And see, the more you believe God about who he says you are in Christ, the less the sin issue, okay? Because you're walking in the truth of who he says you are and you're taking God at his word. When he says you're, you're accepted in the beloved, that means you are accepted in Christ. You're a beloved child of God. And you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You're seated in heavenly places. You get to hold your head up high, come boldly to the throne of grace for the time, uh, help in time of need. All of that. And you believe it. And you take him at his word. What does that look like? Is that going to look like more sin and rebellion? No. Because you're spiritually minded. You're thinking on things that are heavenly, not here. And you're believing God about who he says you are and what he's done. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I don't have that glorified body yet, but I'm a new creature. I just don't manifest the physical part yet. We'll be glorified. Like Paul says, we're, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. So one day, we're going to put away childish things when we get this body off, okay? And we see him face to face when that perfect comes. And we see him face to face. Then the prophecies will cease. Then the uh, gifts cease. So then all of that ceases. Because we'll be face to face. It says that. For now we see through the glass darkly, but we shall see, we shall see him face to face. And then everything's gonna work out. But it all comes down to what? Taking God at his word, believing God, and God counts us to it to us for righteousness. And it's important that we one believe that he is and a rewarder of those that do, that diligently seek him. Either you believe God or you don't. You're believing God or you're believing John MacArthur. You're believing God or you're believing whatever pastor that tells you you can lose your salvation. Come on. Come on. You gotta believe. And don't believe me either because I could come in here and somebody be better than me and talk you into something else. So what I'm doing is pointing out truth in scripture. You go to God with it. Study your scriptures. Go to God with it. And, and, and reason with him. Reason with him. Because when you reason with him, he'll show you that Jesus did it all. And there's no way you can lose it because if salvation was in your hands, it'd be lost. And it's not. It's in his hands. He's already, it's already done. It's done. By faith, because it goes on, by faith, Noah being warned of God as things not yet seen, like he didn't see the rain coming or anything, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. Why? Because they didn't believe. You think in a hundred, was it 120 years? He said, my spirit shall not dwell with man. It's 120 years. So it's like 120 years that he, he had to warn people. that Because they lived like 900 and something years. Methuselah was 900 and something. And they didn't bring the, he didn't bring the flood till after he was gone. So he had 120 years to preach to people. Hey, because your wickedness, God, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in Genesis 6 back then. You can read about that. But, uh, you know, he just took God at his word. And they didn't. They didn't. They didn't believe. All this is about faith. 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 Okay? Not faithfulness in the sense of service to God, but faith. Believing God. Because that's the difference here. Salvation is, 
is believing what God has done to save you, not what you do to be saved. Okay. It is believing God and he counts it to you for righteousness. That's how you're righteous in his sight. You take him at his word. Can you imagine how frustrating it is to, to give the world what he gave his beloved son? I mean, there's a parable about it when he slew the vineyard owner's son. And, and people still just don't, they call him a liar. Well, you know, it's not just that. You also have to, okay, so you're denying what he accomplished? What do you accomplish him? I mean, none of it makes sense. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. Why? Because he took God at his word. I'm going to take you to a place that's flowing milk and honey. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, with as temporary tents, with Isaac and Jacob. Can you imagine carrying you know, hundreds of your family members and camels and sheep? I mean, I mean, a huge horde a family in the desert, not even knowing where you go, how scary it would be, not knowing where water was. I mean, it just it was crazy, you know, on foot. These people just, just packed up. It's amazing. But he went to the land of promise. See, God promised him. For he looked for a city with hatch, which hath foundations. Now hear this, whose builder and maker is God. So although these are pictures in the scriptures, of places on earth what he was really looking forward to is a place called heaven uh, a habitation uh, not made with hands see uh, uh, the place where God is and that is the gift of eternal life here for he looked for a city with ha which has foundations whose builder and maker is God through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Now, she doubted God at first, but he still gave it to her. She, she did believe and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. It's the same point he's making in Hebrews. Why do you guys keep going to the Levitical law? Why The blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. The law was a shadow of Christ. God wants you to have a heart and full assurance of faith and not that evil conscience. You should have no more consciousness of sin. Christ purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. You, you shouldn't even have that anymore. We're moving on. You don't do sacrifice year by year. He died once for all, perfected us forever. So can we move on now? Let's not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. And it keeps saying that. I mean, you can... Go back and look at Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, Hebrews uh, uh, 11. It's all there. It's all saying it's a shadow, okay? So, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. See, he says, because he judged him faithful who promised, but listen, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, that they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see, did you catch that? See, our home is not here. It's with the Lord. And we know we have eternal. Does, does it sound like Abraham was wondering did I make it? No. Because it tells you they knew they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. And so are you. Because it's not your home. For they say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. You see, they knew where they were going. And God tells us we can. Why can't we? If you're basing it on you, 
Oh, man, that's some sinking sand right there. You're going to be like, oh, oh, I had a good day. I must be saved. Oh, I had a really, oh, maybe I'm not saved. Oh, that's some terrible foundation, man. But when you're on that solid rock, Jesus, it's like, oh, yeah, it's all by him. Yeah, I'm saved. Well, you, you did that today, though. It ain't about me. He already did it. I'm saved. I'm good. It's what you need to know. And then you have a great day. Yeah, that's great, but I didn't save myself. See, you can't get puffed up in pride and you can't get condemned. Either way, it's all about, count it all joy. It's all Jesus. Do, do Christians realize they should be jumping up and down for joy, like Brother Luke says? Do you have any idea what God gave you as a gift? If that encourages you to be more sinful and rebellious against your father who gave you everything, everything. He owns it all. It's amazing to me. Just people don't get it. All right, anyway, so by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Here's the big point I wanted to make. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Do you see there? It's a shadow of Christ, the son of the promise. It wasn't his only son, though. It wasn't. Of whom it was said that in Isaac, thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received in him a figure. You see, Isaac's the figure of Christ. So Abraham received the figure of Christ in the incident with his own son. You see that? Let's read that again. Again, this is Hebrews chapter 11, 18, 17, 18, 19, and 20. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received in him a figure. You see why he said, because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So he can't, he, he has to raise him up. Even if I sacrifice my son, God has to raise him up because he made that promise. In Isaac, thy seed shall be called. So the seed of Christ, I mean, the seed of Abraham is coming through Isaac. So even if Abraham kills